Hello everyone and welcome back. So today we are going to talk about another specific topic which is a very important topic but seem very um, not let as a modern people don't make uh, special attention to that and that is train of four monitoring. So train of four monitoring is very very important for all the modalities which are done to monitor the uh, EMG or muscle recording including uh, EMG motor evoke potential and transcranial motor evoke potential. So we want to make sure we are doing this. So the objective for this presentation is to learn about the anatomy and physiology related to neuromuscular junction, uh, about the basic principles of train of four monitoring and how to do, uh, how the neuromuscular block blockers affect our recordings, uh, learn proper electrode placement and recording and stimulation per setup. Also the significance of monitoring neuromuscular blockage during anesthesia and how to interpret the train of four and its significance in assessing the neuromuscular blockade. We want to learn about the advantages of accurately monitoring train of four and the potential pitfalls for not monitoring it correctly. So anesthesia is designed to induce muscle relaxation for various surgical procedures um, and that helps for optimizing uh, best surgical procedure for surgeon uh, because the muscle is relaxed so they can make easy incision and cutting through the muscles to reach out to the bone and the brain brain and the spinal cord and also for the patient uh, for have um, uh, easy surgery. However, uh, the accurate back balance is very difficult and an uh, optimal muscle relaxation is required which avoid any residual paralysis which can be challenging post-operatively. Intraoperatively, if you have too much muscle relaxant, we cannot do monitoring uh, in those type of surgery from the muscles. Uh, the, so because of this train of four monitoring comes into the play, uh, we provide a real-time feedback to the surgeon and anesthesiologist about the neuromuscular function and train of monitoring allows anesthesiologists to tailor their dose uh, to have accurate neuromuscular uh, blockage during the surgical procedure which is required for that surgery. So train of four monitoring operates on the principle of assessing the res residual of skeletal muscle to nerve stimulation. Neuromuscular blocking agent uh, interrupt the transmission of these signals from the nerves to the muscles through the neuromuscular junction and cause paralysis. Uh, train of four stimulation involves dealing of the series of four electrical stimuli and the resulting in muscle response that is observed and measured and inter uh, interpreted for the uh, data. This helps in determining the degree of neuromuscular blockage um, and guide anesthesia to provide adjusted dose to this patient. So patient receiving neuromuscular blocking should be monitored for neuromuscular function during all type of surgery. Going back to the history, um, the first paper uh, pu published by Ali and et al. in 1970 developed and published the train of four technique and it has been used in the same method since then. So the train of four technique was developed in, the, uh, in order to provide a real time feedback at the level to give a feedback about the level of the muscle relaxation in the patient. The principle was to produce a pattern of stimulation and, uh, and that did not require to comparison of the evoke response uh, or don't need to have a balance and before ad administration of anesthesia. So this pattern of the uh, train stimulation involves stimulating the uh, ulnar nerve which was published in 1970. So they used the ulnar nerve with train of four supramaximal stimulation they used the frequency of 2 hertz for 2 seconds um, and also applied a uh, train of 4 at the rate of 10 per second, uh, every 10 second, which is the rate of 0.1 hertz. And they compared the data for T1, which is the first twitch, to uh, control twitch. It also enables comparison of train 4, T4, to train 1 and see what is the difference between the amplitude and the responses. So, in order to go back, uh, go into details about the how to do neuromuscular. Uh, block it, uh, evaluation by train of four, it is important to understand the neuromuscular junction. So neuromuscular junction or NMJ is a junction between the terminal end of the neuron and the muscle fiber. It is a site of transmission of action potential uh, from nerves to the uh, muscle fiber to the synapse. It also site for many diseases and site of action for many any drugs which causes, uh, which affect the muscle contraction. So there are seven steps of neuromuscular junction uh, and action potential travels down the axon um, to the axon terminal, electrical gated calcium channel open. Once the calcium channel open, it causes the vesicle to release the neurotransmitter and that is acetylcholine. Acetylcholine is released 
uh, and diffuses across the synaptic duct and it, it binds with the ion channels in the muscle fibers. If the muscle, uh, these muscle fiber reaches the threshold that is about minus 50 millivolts uh, inside the neuron at the motor end plate, acetylcholine, then it causes contraction and acetylcholine is broken down by uh, different agents and it's reuptake. So the, here we can see a picture of a neuromuscular junction and we can see the terminal cleft which is, has a sm small vesicles and they secrete all these uh, acetylcholine and we have at the motor end plane we can we see neurotransmitter gated channels um, and once they are activated uh, they activate the voltage gated sodium channel and sodium moves in which causes inside negative 70 60 70 millivolts to becomes more positive or and cause a depolarization wave so when this depolarization wave uh, starts it causes action potential uh, propagation of action potential in the muscle fiber and when it stops the potassium channel opens and cause repolarization so again another uh, view of neuromuscular junction uh, from different so we try to do, we always do neuromuscular so the paper published by ali was focused on uh, the technique using other nerve stimulation but in the surgical procedure when we are doing uh, train of four monitoring we always do the train of four monitoring for most distal muscle so here we can see stimulation of posterior tibial nerve with the cathode distal and anode proximal which is opposite to somatosensory evoke potential because when you're doing somatosensory evoke potential we are stimulating and recording from proximal uh, recording site from spinal cord brainstem uh, and brain but for train of four we are stimulating at the, at the same place but we're recording from a distal muscle which is the abductor hallucis muscle so we stimulate with the cathode distal and anode more proximal so these are acetylcholine when we stimulate this they are stored in vesicles in the motor end planes and they release the nerve plus ends uh, and it and the, and the acetylcholine release and it causes action on the neuromuscular junction so acetylcholine is synthesized from choline and acetate 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 and choline and is stored in vesicles at the motor end plane and it multiplies in the cleft by choline esterase in few in few milliseconds there are multiple nicotinic acetylcholine receptors and they consist of five glycoprotein subunits with two alpha one beta one delta and one gamma uh, acetylcholine binds to two alpha subunits uh, to open the channel there are about one to two million receptors across cell membranes only one alpha subunit needs for non depolarizing muscle action to attack and block both alpha subunit need succinylcholine attached to the to block the muscle as well so the so the, for the biochemistry of neuromuscular junction um, just a summary here there's a synthesis of acetylcholine in in the neuron at the terminal end of the neuron and the these acetylcholine are also reuptake when they are released they are taken back and stored again and released again and the release of neurotransmitter in the synaptic cleft and then number four binding to the receptors on the motor end plant which causes degradation of uh, there's a degradation of acetylcholine by acetylcholine stress in the cleft and recycling of choline by the terminal neuron so there are two type of neuromuscular blocking agent we are going to talk about one is called depolarizing muscle relaxant and other is known as non-depolarizing muscle blocker muscle relaxant or muscle blocker the key difference between the depolarizing and non-depolarizing muscle blocker is that depolarizing neuromuscular blocker act at acetylcholine re receptor agonist so the depolarizing act as acetylcholine agonist while the non-depolarizing they act as an antagonist and they are competitive so the depolarizing is non-competitive and and non-depolarizing are co competitive the new muscular blocking commonly used for skeletal muscle relaxation and and they block the neurotransmission blockage uh, between the neuron and the muscles so as a result the muscle does not contract and remain paralyzed uh, so neuromuscular blocking agents are very helpful in surgeries especially involving the uh, where the large muscles arc need to be cut to reach out to the target um, site of the surgery first talking about the depolarizing muscle blocker so the most common one is succinylcholine is a is a it's a very short acting and it is a binding site of uh, it, it binds and it's a very well known depolarizing neuromuscular blocker and it is typically used for uh, for induction because the because it's it acts uh, for a short duration of time 
it is called it causes in, in initial when it when it binds to the receptor it causes initial contraction and cause fasciculation so you will we'll see some contraction and that and that follow after that there's no acetylcholine choline cannot bind to those receptors so that cause muscle relaxation followed by initial fasciculation on the other hand non depolarizing blockers are competitive and they compete with acetylcholine on these receptors uh, uh, so the most common depolarizer is succinylcholine and for the non depolarizer we have curarep and curonium when vicuronium rocuronium atricuronium mavicurium so there are multiple um, or which act between 30 minute to up to 90 minute so the pharmacokinetics of neuromuscular blocking is um, here we can see that from this paper published by Sloan in 2013. Um, the, uh, we can see this intubating dose is milligram per kg, succinate cone is about 1 milligram, um, and, and atricurium is 0.1, rocuronium is 0.6 milligram per kg, rocuronium is 0.1, and very strong dose. So, comparing the depolarizer to non depolarizer is very important. Uh, the depolarizing drug they have two types of phase one block and phase two block. In phase phase one block, they decreases the twitches. There is no fade in that. The fade means that the drop in the amplitude of the second, third, and fourth response. So if that uh, and um, so all the four responses they drop in amplitude together and they reappear together. So with the first twitch, uh, uh, on comparing to the non depolarizer where there's a fade, the fourth twitch becomes smaller and smaller and then disappear and then third one and the fourth, second one and the last one and the last one to go. But the depolarizer, all four are decreased in amplitude. There's a small, very short phase two block where may it resemble non depolarizer blockage and may see some kind of fade. So non depolarizers act on at least one alpha subunit and they're competitive, uh, compete for that uh, acetylcholine receptors and for non depolarizer we will see a fade decrease um, in uh, amplitude of the final twitch comparing to this uh, to the previous twitch so if then fourth twitch t4 is decrease in amplitude then t3 and then t1 and the t1 is the last one so when they reappear the t1 appears before t2 uh, we can also see post statistic facilitation and potential by other non depolarizer and uh, uh, so, again, this is a, just a graph of depolarizing non depolarizer. The most common one used is succinylcholine and reversal, which can which has been used to reverse succinylcholine, is galabedion. Uh, for non depolarizer, we, we have um, atracurium, venkuronium, uh, pencuronium, different, and the, uh, there are different reversal agents which are used to reverse and reverse the paralysis, uh, such as neostigmine. Uh, we also use uh, uh, glabidian and cysteine. So they're different one, and there's a new one, pseudomedics, uh, which are going to talk later. So again, definition of uh, this, uh, these are the difference between the uh, two. Uh, short summary between definition, mechanical affection, competitive and non-competitive, uh, generation action potential, depolarization and binding, and opening of sodium channel in uh, the examples of some of the drugs. So the side effect of neuromuscular blocking are important. Depolarizing cause bradycardia. Uh, it cause post because it it also cause post operative pain because of initial fasciculation because there's an initial contraction of the muscle all muscles. So that is, may result in post operative pain. So these patients need some pain medication during surgery. They also call hyperkalemia uh, and they can also call malignant hyperthermia. So malignant hyperthermia is a very fatal uh, reaction. And that, uh, that's why every operating uh, room in the world, almost every in the world, they have a hyperthermia cot because patients have sudden rise in temperature with the tachycardia and it has to be treated right away in order to prevent any uh, fatality. On the non depressing it causes tachycardia, it may cause bronchospasm and may cause hypotension in these patients because of muscle relaxation properties. So here we can see... Um, four twitches in train of four uh, on the first picture on the top we can see we have four twitches and then uh, the second one uh, as rocuronium was given so you can see that the fade on twitch number one two three four all of them and and train of four and then third four twitches disappears and then only one twitch is left t1 which is only train of four one uh, one and at the end we have only four twitches so we are stimulating four times 
but first we are getting all four good responses because before the um, injection of rocuronium but then the, there's a fade and then we lose the four twitch then we lose all three twitches and then we lose the ostrich so and at the bottom we, we can see sugamedex which is a reversal agent if you give a sugamedex at when we have after giving rocuronium um, we'll see the f the return of all the four twitches very soon a few minutes so Suga, Suga Medics is a revolution in neuromuscular blockade reversal. It was first approved to use by European Union in 2008. The FDA initially rejected NDA for similar in 2008, but finally approved the medication for use in US in the summer of 2015. It is number one reversal agent, uh, and it is, uh, has been approved for, ch for children above two years of age and in a dose of two milligram per kg to reverse the moderate uh, train of four count more than two to two, two by four so um, so if it's, it's a train of four count is less than two or two or less is typically not given and there's not enough data about the effect of um, patient less than two years of age so sugamedics is a new drug that reverses the neuromuscular blocking action by selectively binding rocuronium and vacuronium so it's typically given only to reverse the action of rocuronium and vacuronium it has been proved for used um, as I mentioned, of kids more than of the patient more than two years old, um, it may potentially replace the succinylcholine because succinylcholine is given for very short action. But now we can give uh, procurinum and If you want a very short action, you can use sugamedex and reverse that. Is um, not the best practice, but it's, it may be going toward that side. So it, it seems to be, the data shows it's safe in patients with impaired neuromuscular transmission, including Mesenia gravis. Uh, there's no data available on long-term use of sugamedics and it's relatively high cost for anesthesia-related drug has been justified. So, so these are the doses um, for an average reversal time of three minutes of in rocuronium induced neuromuscular blockage. So if you have given rocuronium um, and the dose of uh, 16 milligram per kg uh, immediate reversal of uh, within 1 to 1.5 minute if you give 4 milligram per kg uh, and the train post genetic uh, twitch is 1 into 2 take 3 minutes and 2 milligram uh, routine reversal uh, 2 minutes of 1 milligram to take about 2 minutes and give 0.22 milligram per kg uh, and it's about 2 minutes so most of the time the signal reverse to 4 twitches within 2 to minutes so those recommendations of rocuronium after sugar medics is so if you are giving uh, rocuronium again so if you do, uh, the, typically so if you're doing pedicles testing or nerve testing and you have to reverse that and you do that or you're doing a wake-up test but uh, you, you, we do, don't do immediate another uh, bolus or in or iv for the any neuromuscular blocking agent okay if you have to give rocuronium so for um so so if uh, if you wait for five minutes you can give 1.2 milligram rocuronium per kg and if you can wait for four hours you can give 0.6 milligram per kg so when we give the muscle relaxant so it's very important which muscles are paralyzed first the so face is always the first one to get paralyzed then the upper extremity and the and the leg and foot are the last one and and for the, and the reason is that um, when we give any muscle action, we give in the intravenous and go to the heart and pump to the whole body. Heart is pumping at the rate of uh, 60 beats per 70 beats per minute, which is about 1.1, 1 1.2 hertz. So the we have average person has five, six liters of blood. So all the blood is pumped every second. So the distance doesn't count as much as the vascular supply. So all the muscles which are highly vascular, so the muscle are, uh, the ratio of the muscle and the blood supply is is very good one to one. Um, or better, uh, for example, face, face has a facial artery and so, and the very small muscles. So the muscle action reaches these facial muscles very quickly and can paralyze them. Then the upper extremity, the brachial artery is a little bit bigger and the muscles are much bigger. So take a longer time to reach those muscles to get paralyzed. And the leg have femoral artery and take a very long time to very large muscles and, and fatty tissue and more. And the leg muscles, so it take longer time to get paralyzed in the foot. So if you have four twitches, if the patient is paralyzed in the face, doesn't mean the leg or foot is paralyzed. So patient may be moving or have all four twitches with the zero twitches in the face. So once we stop giving the and we're waiting for the reversal, 
So the face is reverse first, and the reason is that face, face is again highly vascular. So we have venous drainage, better venous, venous drainage. So the blood is drained quicker in the face than upper extremity and lower extremity. Why we are mentioning that? I'm mentioning that because if you are doing any surgery, if it's cervical surgery or brain surgery, many times people say, okay, I'm doing cervical case, so I do train of four from the hand. So that's not true. So if you're doing EMG or MEP from lower limb, leg and foot muscle, which should be doing in many cases, even for cervical cases and brainstem surgeries or brain surgeries. So we should be monitoring the foot muscle for train of four. Because if you have train of four from the foot, that means we have train of four from all the muscles. Um, but if you don't have train of four in hand, you can you can you can say you be confident that you have train of four out of four in face, but you cannot be confident in saying that you have four out of four from the foot because foot take much longer. So it should be obvious if you are not doing any foot or lower leg EMG. For for example, you are doing thyroid cases or parotid surgery, and so you don't doing so you are not even doing upper extremity. So hand train of four from median nerve or ulnar nerve will be fine for those surgery. So why we so if the muscle accent is affecting our signal, why we want to do that? So the reason we do muscle accentation, as I mentioned earlier, is for ad adequate intubation. If you because you want the vocal cord to be relaxed, so when you're putting the endotracheal tube to cause uh, to avoid any damage, for adequate surgical exposure, so surgeon is exposing for scoliosis case or spinal uh, posterior spinal fusion. So I have a lot of big muscles, so you have to cut through them. So you need extra good exposure, relaxed muscle. And also for mechanical intubation ventilation, so patient is not if the patient is not breathing on its own, and it's on the ventilation during surgical procedure, or sometime in ICU. So if the patient is ICU, or for long term burst suppression or there on ventilation, then you need a muscle accent to cause that. So there's a variable response to each individual. Every individual is different. So. Uh, we don't know how what are the exact dose will cause correct intubation uh, paralysis. So train of four monitoring can help the anesthesia or the surgical team to titrate that dose and give make sure the patient is appropriately relaxed. So there's also the narrow therapeutic window, so you cannot give just a large boluses of every medication, and there's no deductible block for up to 75-80 percent block. So if there's a patient has 50% paralysis, 60% paralysis, 70% paralysis, uh, or sometimes 75%, you don't see any changes in train of four. So we still get, you can still get good four out of four twitches uh, with 70% blockage. Why? Because once you lose the four twitch or you have a fade on the four twitch more than 30%, more than 10%, that means you already have 70% block. So we cannot detect any paralysis from zero to 75% percent so once you get the muscle action, the paralysis is complete, about 90 to 95 percent uh, receptors are occupied. So uh, so the adequate muscle action responds to narrow range of 85 to 90 percent receptors. So we cannot tell anything and then after 90 percent, the patient is fully paralyzed. So we have very short window. Also, also for the post-operative, for post-operative muscle action occur even with intermediate acting neuromuscular. So, so if even you give a short uh, neuromuscular non depressing agents, patient can still have been muscle relaxed, some of the muscle are relaxed. So we want satisfactory recovery before we extubate the patient. If you take the tube out, patient is breathing on the arm and patient is, uh, the muscle are paralyzed, patient not be breathing, patient may, um, in, uh, may uh, aspirate and cause some pulmonary, pulmonary uh, pneumonia, embolism and some other drug. Uh, complications. Uh, onset of recovery and neuromuscular blocking agent occur at different rates in different muscles, uh, different between face, hand and feet. And intraoperative effort is needed for adequate muscles to make sure EMG monitoring and motor evoke potential monitoring is accurate. So when we give this muscle relaxation, at the, if 90% of muscles or more are paralyzed, then that's a good muscle relaxation. Uh, good relaxation for surgical exposure. For intubation, we need 95% of muscle relaxation and total flexibility, you need about 99% muscle paralysis. So now there are three main type, different type of neuromuscular stimulator available to monitor the level of muscle relaxation. Single twitch, tetanic stimulation and train of force stimulation. So these are used in clinical setting 
Uh, these are also used in interoperatively by anesthesiologists. Um, the device is capable of doing single twitch tetanic stimulation and, and train of force stimulation. But for our ne interoperative neuro monitoring purposes, we use only train of force monitoring and we'll talk about it later. So, what is a single cell stimulation? Single cell stimulation is you just stimulate single one pulse and before we give any muscle relaxation and anesthesia and during the surgery you you compare the twitch with that baseline uh, so there's no recording it's just a stimulation and you physically uh, visually monitoring the level of the strength of the twitch and you come you need to have a baseline and you cannot if you don't have baseline you cannot compare that so mono it's a monophasic square pulse the duration of the pulse is 500 microsecond or half millisecond um, it is the least precise because it depends on the person uh, observation uh, it need a baseline before giving any anesthesia uh, also if there's a change uh, there's about 75 80 percent block and if that's twitch disappears there's 90 95 percent block so here is this example a single stimuli applied to peripheral motor nerve between at the rate of 0.1 hertz to 1 hertz and depend, depend on the, the responses we get independent on frequency of stimulation so if you stimulate slower you get better response you can stimulate fast you get uh, bad responses so if, so the second for the first picture you can see the stimulation strength is uh, no change from 0.1 to 1 hertz so you can be stimulating and you're getting good responses uh, for non depolarizing block uh, we can see the fade this signal gets smaller and then disappears and then uh, and the deep rising block we can see that it, uh, it drops uh, and there's no fade in there the second one is called tetanic stimulation tetanic stimulation is um, again monophasic square pulse uh, it's either uh, cathode anode mostly cathodic pulse uh, duration is 500 microsecond 0.5 second we stimulate at the rate of 30 hertz to 100 hertz so minimum we do 30 hertz or 50 hertz stimulation and we see fade with non depolarizing muscle um, and if the patient has an additional agent it also increases the fade and we see the post tetanic facilitation which is uh, which is a response uh, we see of when the muscle is recovering before we see start decaying train of four for the post tetanic facilitation the third one uh, it is used for when no twitches are present um, so five second stimulation five second 50 hertz stimulation we pass for three seconds and stimulate at one hertz. Uh, we count the number of stitches. The number of stitches present is inversely proportional to the time of return of train of four. Uh, now the fourth, the last one we are focusing today is the train of four stimulation, which is the most common type of stimulation used and in the OR for the neuro mounting team it is always used on uh, the train of four. So, so when we are doing train of four, we have to make sure we are adhering to the same guidelines which were published in 1970 by Ali and everyone is using throughout and all over the world globally and the reason is when you're comparing the data the level of muscleization it depends on the um, on the technique so if you are if you are stimulating for longer time or a shorter time or too fast or too slow you cannot compare uh, the two recording from two different medical centers so we always stimulate with a 200 microsecond which is different than tetanic stimulation and, um, single twitch which is 500 microsecond so we do 200 microsecond the rate is 2 hertz is faster but only for 2 seconds what we do is we compare 4 twitch to the first twitch so t4 to t1 ratio is recorded throughout the surgical procedure if there's no t4 present then we do t3 to t1 the decrease in twitch intensity or c map amplitude is called fade so the, if you see the decrease in the amplitude in the t4 that is known as fade and fade is only seen by non-depolarizing, but not with the depolarizing such in that collision. So train of force stimulation um, is stimulating peripheral nerve with T1, T2, T3, T4. And we calculate the calculation between T4 and T1. So if T4 disappears or decreases more than 20-30%, uh, maximum 30% for anesthesia, they don't they cannot extubate if it is less more than 10% fade. For neuro mounting, so even you are more on relaxed side, so you can go up to 20 30 percent, but you cannot use 40 percent fade. 40 percent fade means zero twitch, so 20 or 30 percent should be the maximum. So once you have less than uh, 20 percent fade on T4, 
that means 75 to 80 percent muscle 85 percent muscles are paralyzed so we have only three out of four twitches if we have two twitches disappear then we mean we have 85 percent muscles are paralyzed if we have only one response one out of four twitches 95 percent muscles are paralyzed and if you have zero twitches then 100 percent muscles are paralyzed here we can see the comparison between the single twitch train of four in the middle and the fade on train of four so you, so on the left side there's only single twitch you stimulate single twitch again again and you compare visibly you, there's no recording then so that's another thing so that's what it's least precise you're not recording you're just looking at the twitch moving of the thumb so train of four in the middle you see a good no response muscle relaxation you stimulate four times you get a four responses that's presence of t, t of four four after four on the right side we see fade on the train that t3 is smaller than uh, t1 t4 is smaller than t3 t3 is smaller than t2 and t2 is smaller than t1 so there's a fade so technically t4 here is zero twitch so t3 is also zero because more than 50 percent t3 is more than 30 percent fade so it's only one twitch even we see four twitches with a fade so we are not going to save four twitches with 70 per 60 percent fade we are going to save we have only train of four one out of four so non depolarizing agent as i said mentioning so in the green we can see the there's a fade on that so it's a single twitch because second third fourth they're all more than 30 percent drop um in the the middle one blue twitch we don't see if the four twitch we see only first three twitches and uh, so it's again the second twitch is smaller than 80 per 70 percent of the first t1 amplitude so that doesn't count and obviously the third twitch is 50 percent so that doesn't count so it's only train of four one out of one and then we have only one twitch left which is 50 percent of the original amplitude so that's counted as zero twitch and then we don't see a response so those are multiple scenarios that we can see there the same again uh, we have t1 or r1 at t1 t2 t3 t4 and here we can see t4 or r4 is 50 percent so that's zero and t3 is more than 70 percent decrease so that's zero so we have only two out of four twitches here so every time we are doing uh, emg or motor evoke potential in any case or cortico bulbar mp any muscle recording or pref preference is have no muscle relaxation so you cannot go and sometime this okay if we have two out of four twitches you have 50 percent no two out of four is not 50 uh, per, per paralysis so one out of three out of four is not 25 percent uh, two out of four is not 50 percent and three out of four is not 75 percent paralysis two out of four means you have 95 percent 85 percent paralysis so we want we don't even want three out of four because three out of four you lost 80 percent of the muscles so how can we monitor accurately we want to have accurate monitoring and give maximum protection to the patient so we need to have no muscle relaxation so you can give uh, short acting muscle relaxation for intubation and sometime need for extubation uh, sorry uh, for relaxation for exposure but before exposure we want to have a baseline so you can do intubation you do a baseline and then you can give some muscle relaxation and but before you start doing the muscle uh, any type of instrumentation or any uh, reach out to the muscles or, um, or the nerves then we need to switch to train of four out of four so we want to have no muscle relaxation on any cases after intubation when we are not we are when we are doing emg so this is a train of four uh, emg response um, and uh, <coughs> during the non depressing neuromuscular blockage and we can see the drop in amplitude in, in the top, from the top to bottom so the first one have four out of four digits the second is the fade and third one is is uh, is more fade so you can see degrees in in this paper published in 1984 uh, so again um, on the right side we have a b c d so the pattern of muscle relaxation to uh, twitch stimulation uh, after we give a non depressing muscle blocking agent and then we give a new stigmine so you can see uh, when we give non depressing muscle agent so there's a fade and this in a so the signals start dropping and when you give that new stigmine to reverse that the signal start coming back with reverse fade for the b uh, the image number b succinylcholine is given so all the drops at the amplitude so we don't see any fade in that on this the picture number c uh, the train for monitoring of onset of neuromuscular followed by and 
uh, same thing. Uh, so you can see four twitches separately. So uh, with the non depressing the four twitches are as soon as you give the the neuromuscular blocking agent, the four twitch drops, then third, then second, and then four, first one. And then when they reappear, the first one appears, then second, the third, and they increase in amplitude until all four appears. Compared to the last one, the deep picture, uh, with succinyl is given, you can see all four decreases in amplitude and all four deep drop or disappears and then all four appear and they get bigger and bigger. So even you have all four present, but they are not accurate amplitude, so they can be very, very small responses. So it doesn't mean the patient is at four out of four twitches. So regarding the programming setup, so when you're doing programming setup, so you typically have, foot, you start from top to the bottom muscle. So you have all channel number 15, you have left foot, left abductor helices, reference to uh, left abductor helices and on the, on the other amplifier you have right abductor helices or uh, reference to the right abductor helices. So you can place on any any other input but um, that's at the recording so when you're doing recording the two muscles uh, placed, uh, two electrode placed in abductor helices you can also do some people do abductor helices reference to extensor helices brevis or extensor helices longus in the foot muscle uh, on, and for the and for the channel uh, so you can have channel number one and channel 15, 16 or channel one, two, uh, active reference reference to each other. Um, you can shorten their name. So you don't have to write the whole name. So for the, for the saving the space on the screen, the input gain, which is also known as the dynamic range. So this gain is not a sensitivity or screen gain. So, and it's also not a gain of the amplifier, which amplifies. So this is called input gain. It's also known as gain. It's also the correct name is dynamic range, which is the range of the amplifier. Uh, so any signal bigger than that will be start clipping. So if you see any clipping on any signal, typically you see in motor evoke potential because the gain is shorter. Uh, the gain may be accurate for the EMG or trigger EMG, but may not be good for train of four or motor evoke potential. So you have to open the grain. Uh, so minimum input gain you should have with 500 microgram per division. And there's a 10 division vertical and horizontal. So 500 microvolt per division means time multiplied by 10 vertical divisions. So it's a 5000 microvolt signal. So any signal which is more than 5 millivolt or 5000 microvolt will be uh, passed without clipping. So clipping will be, so if you see clipping just increase to 1000. Uh, so we can say, okay, why not keep it always up? But if you keep it open more all the time, then you see all the unwanted signal and you see more noisy signal. High cut, um, high cut is, uh, uh, should be, so this, I have to fix the slide so it should be the low cut 10 hertz and high cut should be 5000 5, hertz so uh, low cut signal is 10 hertz and high cut should be 5000 hertz and notch filter should be off for uh, train of four uh, again this is uh, one of the programs so and you can use in any software so program so you can set up this in your amplifier and the channel setup so for the stimulation setup uh, you can use simulator number one or if you have two stimulators you can use stimulator number two uh, if you one is near the hand, one, the other is near the foot, so you can use any stimulator. Uh, you can use output number three or four. So this is for right foot. So if the right foot is on three, now if typically we have left, right, left hand, right hand, left foot, right foot. So it's a right foot high stimulation, and we use constant current stimulation. And pulse rate is 200 microsecond. You can start with five or 10 milliampere, and maximum is 10. You can go to 100 milliampere if you're not getting anything, but typically if you're getting two and a four more than 25. 30 milliampere, you have a lot of muscle paralyzed. Uh, polarity should be reversed because we use the same electrode we use for SSCP recording. So SSCP we use active reference, um, cathode is more proximal. So when you reverse the polarity, you don't have to unplug. So the distal electrode becomes cathode. The rep rate is used 2 hertz, so don't change it. Many times people see, I see they are 2.79, 3.79. So don't use the rep rate used for SSCP or other anything else. Train of four should always be done in two hertz, two seconds with 200 microseconds. So depending on the surgical and the muscle you're using, we always recommend, uh, recommending to use for most distal muscles. So the most distal muscle is foot, you do posterior tibial and record for abductor helices. If you are recording from, uh, you can also, some issues, patient had fracture or trauma or have cast, you cannot stimulate, you can stimulate peroneal nerve at the fibula, head of fibula, at the, uh, fibular nerve and record from tibialis anterior muscle. Uh, if you're not doing lower extremity EMG and MEP, you can do median nerve and record from abductor pollicis brevis. 
and you can also stimulate facial nerve and regard from RS muscle. Same stimulation setup. Uh, this is summary of the same muscles. So these are stimulation side, posterior nerve at medial medullus, peroneal nerve head of fibula, medial nerve at the wrist between palmaris longus and extrusor carpi radialis, and other nerve at the more proximal and the facial nerve for this one. So you can use all these muscles for stimulation and recording. And you can use these muscles from foot, leg, hand and face for recording train of four. So abductor helices from the foot muscles, extensor helices brevis, you can reference to that one. Uh, you can use tibialis anterior, uh, abductor GMA, extensor brevis, and you can use uh, subdermal needle for recording EMG. We can use surface ele electrode for stimulation. Um, much better to than the needle electrode if the patient has edema or swelling or uh, uh, some issue, then you can use the needle electrode and ground electrode. So here we can see some examples. So on the left side, you can see this uh, single start stimulation for trainer four. So we have stimulated from median nerve and recording from abductor pollicis brevis, and we can see the movement of the uh, middle finger. So this is a single twitch, and and uh, this is another single twitch. So every patient, depending on which fibers you are actually activating, so you can see activation of. And on the right side, so if you had, this is the stimulation at 30 hertz. So when you stimulate the 30 hertz, so all the muscles contract together. And patient, even you ask the person to open the hand, they cannot because all the muscles are in tetanic stage. So all the muscles are contracting together. So you can do in 30 hertz stimulation, you can try in 30 hertz stimulation or 50 hertz stimulation. So, if we have a recording screen, uh, which we should have for all the interoperative uh, cases, we can see uh, recording train of four is different in different um, IUNM systems. Uh, so, there are three different examples from three different equipment. We can see the bar chart and we can also see the responses. So, always look at the responses, real responses. So, don't uh, depend on the bar chart because bar chart you can see the the tr tracker or the or the markers are can be placed on the wrong place uh, by the computer so you, you can move them cursor you can move manually but uh, if there's no response or there's the cursor is wrong place so you can have zero response and the cursor is on the stimulation artifact on the peak and trough uh, and it creates as a, a four out of four twitches so always look at the at the at the bar chart and the real responses and if you, are, if you have a cursor, you move the cursor to the accurate place for peak and trough to see a correct response and see how much is the fade between first twitch and the third twitch. So let's go to some of the examples. So this is the first patient. Uh, I'm stimulating at 25 milliampere and you can see no responses. You see very, very small, tiny responses. The sensitivity of the screen, and this is not a gain of the input gain. Now this is, so gain, input gain, um, to affect the signal permanently, but uh, screen sensitivity is just zoom in, zoom out phenomena. So if you increase, uh, it will get smaller. If you decrease, it gets uh, larger. So right now we are using 200 microvolt per division. Uh, so the signal is less than 10 microvolts in size. Uh, four out all four twitches present. Uh, I'm increasing to 30 milliampere. So I still have very small response. So I have zero twitches. So now we have to, uh, 30, we have response, but it is not an accurate response. So we don't count as four out of four twitches or increase the sensitivity to five microvolt. It, it will look like a huge signal. So make sure we are not doing that. We want to have at least the signal at 200 microvolt or higher. So 50 microvolt, 60 microvolt, 100 microvolt is not an accurate signal. So now um, I increase the stimulation to 40 milli milliampere uh, this is stimulation from the foot and recording from the foot, left foot. And you can see we have all four twitches except the third twitch is abnormal. And that is not a typical response. I have to do it again to make sure this is an error. Um, so I'm increased to 50 milliampere. Now the signal is getting bigger. So it's, so that is the sign that there's some kind of response, muscle relaxation still present in the patient. Because if you stimulate the nerve directly, you get a response, exposed nerve. 
you get response at one or two million pair any peripheral nerve response at one to two million pair cranial nerve response from less than 0 0.1 0 0.2 million pair so if, if the peripheral nerve is responding at one or two with direct stimulation to the skin it should respond at four or five million pair but if you have to stimulate 30 40 million pair that means there's a level of muscle relaxation relaxation that is causing that block so now increasing the 100 million pair the morphology change you can see the change the single morphology from biphasic to triphasic to multiphasic and it's a huge response so i'll say okay i have four stitches but if i have four stitches 100 that means i have more than 80 percent muscle paralyzed another patient uh, stimulating at 25 million pair and getting response from right foot right adductor helices reference to the right extensor helices um, uh, uh, right ex uh, so we see the responses they are present at the 50 microvolt so this 50 microvolt per dvm so this signal is 50 microvolts so it's not enough signal to, to uh, we stimulate at 30 millimeter the signal is now about one two three four it's so about 180 microvolt the so 200 microvolt signal so the signal is much better just moving from 25 to 5 million here if i get to 35 the signal is getting bigger it's not uh, it's not at supra maximum at 50 getting much it's now we see clipping the signal is much larger and it's chopping off and 75 is getting clipping again have all four responses 100 off the, off the chart so do we have a level of any muscleization should we count uh, which one we should count as a four stitches 35 30 25 50 so that's a question i have for you uh, some food of thought and then you should think about that so another patient patient three uh, this is I kept the stimulation at 45 milliampere, so I'm not changing the stimulation intensity, but I'm just waiting. So at 8 o'clock, you can see on the left side, you have all four twitches present. But these twitches, so you can see the first one, T1 is at the top, then T2, T3, T4 is the bottom. So T4 is less than half of first, T3 is also half, and T2 is also half. So only one twitch is T1 out of four at 4 o'clock. After waiting two two hours, the same signal appeared. The left muscle relaxation veered off, and now I have all four stitches at 45 million pair. So now I have good four out of four stitches. Uh, at eight o'clock, I have only one twitch, and ten o'clock I have four stitches. But these stitches are at 45 million pair. So I have still have some level, more than half of the 50 percent muscle paralyzed. That's causing this one. Another patient. Let's go to the patient four. Uh, so I'm stimulating at 400, 100 million pairs. So my patient was giving a muscle relaxation and I'm waiting. We are waiting to the muscle to reverse. No response up to 100. We have 100 million pairs, no response from the left foot. After waiting uh, for a few minutes, we start getting response at 100 million pair, only one twitch. T1. So T1 after 4 at 100 million pairs. Later, we have two twitches. And then, then after 30 minutes, 40 minutes, uh, then we start getting all footages. But these all footages are present at 100. If you go to 90 or 95 or 80, it all disappear. So, do you think this has any muscle relaxation? Do you how much muscle relaxation we should uh, say? Um, is it 50 percent, 100 percent, 90 percent, 10 percent, 0 percent? So, having a train of four at 100 doesn't mean you should not be happy. You cannot start monitoring EMG accurately. So there is going to affect your signal. It's going to cause interpretation problem and you will have misinterpretation of all your data. So every time we are doing a train of four, so I usually like to have my uh, EMG, free run EMG running in the same screen because that if I'm not like uh, here, I'm just seeing one response to my trigger EM train of four on the top. But on spontaneous EMG, um, I'm seeing only one, uh, all four twitches. So I know my, so I'm stimulated from the left foot and I'm getting huge response from the, there's some artifact from the right foot, but uh, the right, left foot is giving me all four twitches in the, in the uh, so these are not the twitches we are, so I'm, what we are looking at the bottom image is the stimulation artifact. So those are the stimulation artifacts. So I, I know I'm stimulating four times, but I'm getting only one response. This is another patient where I, uh, we have a stack of the responses from top to bottom so we have 35 million pair 44 54 64 75 85 95 100 so i'm increasing from 35 million pair to 100 million pair and you can see how this so first which is the first row second is t2 third is three three and the last is t4 so we can see the signals 
so that's so all the signals are present at the same amplitude and so they're decreasing amplitude but all four at the same time so that means it's a succinyl alkylene it's a depolarizing agent if it's a non depolarizing agent there will be a fade though so there will be decrease in amplitude in each signal not all four together and you can see all fours are getting bigger and bigger at the same time and then they peak out about uh, 75 million pairs so the, after 75 there's no uh, increase in amplitude another patient you can see all foot footages there's a depolarizing block with no fade uh, another patient all four they increase from 24 to 100 and then i decrease 25 again you can see the last trait at the bottom disappear everything so the, the these signal they peaked around 44 million pairs so after 44 to 100 the signal 44 or 50, 50 about 50 to 100 it remained the same but from uh, 10 to 50 there was significant change in the amplitude of all the signal now in another patient so it's the same thing we are stimulating from 35 and getting bigger but you can see there's a fade from moving from left to right the first ridge to the fourth ridge the first is the larger than the right one and you can see the signal getting smaller and smaller until we reach to 45 milliampere the first time we reach 40 50, even 50 milliampere 60 million 55 million but there's still fade uh, because of time uh, so we start loss of fade and now we have all 40 four digits present at 45 million pair. so we should always make a clear plane and we should have very good communication with anesthesia and the surgeon so because the surgeon need to know that patient is paralyzed or not paralyzed and surgeon may need the patient paralysis uh, but if you're doing monitoring then you need to have communicate well that you need to have all footages back to monitor the emg while he's decompressing or putting screws or working on the nerve and anesthesia giving a feedback to anesthesia that um, how much muscle relaxation is present it is also important to know that the compromised nerves the nerve who are chronically irritated they will have a different threshold uh, and also the neuromuscular blocking agent make it worse so they have um, so the neuromuscular blocking agent increases the threshold for healthy nerve roots and the nerves so we're giving the muscle accent so that responses of the root will be much higher current uh, than the without muscle relaxation <clears throat> and the injured nerve root will have completely uh, um, much higher so for so the current the injured nerve or compro uh, chronically compromised nerve will have much higher threshold for chronically irritated nerve as for electrical stimulation but for mechanical stimulation the threshold will be very low so if the surgeon touches that or bumps around the nerve it starts firing but when you stimulate it's difficult to get a response so this paper published in 2015 um, by the error bar graph showing the mean intensity threshold for non-compressed nerve on the left side and compressed nerve root on the right side um, and you can see the standard error so it's about 4 million pair plus minus on for the normal row but for the chronic irritated nerve it was about 11 million pair the average plus minus standard deviation there are other factors beside muscle relaxation that can affect our patient because all the uh, the neuromuscular uh, junction has need all the chemicals and end plates and all the neurons so all the uh, oils to facilitate that so any patient taking calcium channel blocker will have effect on trainer 4 patient on steroids uh, patient with diuretic, diuretic special fluosomide and thiazide carbamazepine patient with inhalation agent some anti uh, antibiotics also have effect on trainer 4 antiarrhythmic drugs um, lidocaine propofol beta blockers they also affect our signal uh, electrolyte and thermal disorder hypokalemia hypocalcemia hypomagnesemia hyponatremia hypothermia acidosis these all affect because we are you need calcium you need potassium you need calcium you need magnesium so chlorine so all you need all these for the sodium potassium pump sodium channel potassium channels and if there's a hypokalemia hypotonatremia it's going to affect that patient with organ failure renal failure hepatic kidney or lung, uh, liver failure they will also have effect on trainer four any patient with a neuromuscular disease messina gravis or bell's palsy they will have effect on your trainer four so just think again okay we are stimulating at four million pair should be count as one by four or four by four even if we have all four digits should be counted four by four why we need to do is accurate because we want to interpret the data correctly 
um, many cases for pedicle stimulation threshold, peripheral nerve stimulation threshold, cranial nerve stimulation threshold, MEP stimulation threshold, and interpretation of the data, cortical mapping, uh, dorsal root rhizotomy, and x flip cases, d flip lateral cases, all these cases. So, in conclusion, always set up the most distal muscles. Make sure your stimulation and recording setup is correct. If you are not getting turn of four from one side, try the other side, uh, contralateral side. If you're not getting left foot, try right foot. And if you're not getting both of them, try the left and right uh, fibular nerve. If you don't, then go to hand for troubleshooting, but you cannot count on those. Turn of four should be done throughout the surgical procedure. So it should not be done for once you have turn of four, don't stop doing that. Do it every 10 15 minutes regularly. Keep doing that and keep document that. Keep the intensity to minimum but above the threshold. So, you want super maximum doesn't mean go to 100. Super maximum means you go 50% above the threshold of that nerve. So, um, just a comparison should be if you're getting train of 4 at 50 microvolt per division at 25 milliampere versus 75 milliampere, which one we should count as train of 4 or none of them will count as train of 4. Thank you again and uh, looking forward to your questions. Thank you.